and thank you for having me. This is what happens when you're out of practice traveling, and I left all of my clothes actually on my bed in Phoenix because I'm now in Scottsdale, so you're gonna have to bear with the casual look, but we're all friends here. <laughs> At least I put my face on for you, so. <laughs> and I'm wearing pants. So I'm just gonna move <laughs> to the first objective. So I divided this top into three different parts. I was asked to talk about new and emerging therapies in IBD, but I think for the context of this audience, I wanted to divide it up into strategies for monitoring, potential new treatment options, as well as preventive care, because there are a lot of actually new updates over the past couple of years that I think it's important for you to be aware of to really just make sure you get the most out of the patient provider experience. So the first is this uh, important document that was published a couple of years ago called the STRIDE Consensus. And the reason why I wanted to bring this up in this audience is that previously we gauged a response to treatment based on how you feel. Are you having less diarrhea? Are you seeing blood? Is your pain less? But we know now that clinical symptoms alone aren't enough. So when your provider is bugging you for a stool sample or saying we need to do another colonoscopy, another imaging study, it's because we know that we need a combination of the two. We need to know that your clinical symptoms are improving, but we objectively need to know that there's some improvement with the treatment that we give you. So for Crohn's disease, the two composite symptoms that we look at the most, that it's not all encompassing, are typically abdominal pain and stool frequency, and we want to see improvements over time. However, we have to combine that with an endoscopic endpoint, and that's typically done about 6 to 12 months after we start a treatment that's working. Now, for ulcerative colitis, the two main clinical symptoms that we're looking for improvement are rectal bleeding and stool frequency. We want to see improvements in those, and that has to be followed up with some sort of endoscopic assessment, either with a sigmoidoscopy, so just a quick look at the bottom third of your colon, or a full colonoscopy. So that's part of the reason why your providers are saying, you know what, we need to take a look. It's not just to be cruel, it's because we need that composite endpoint. But as of late, what we're also noting, and many of you probably know this, is that urgency is an under-recognized, under-appreciated symptom of ulcerative colitis. And now, actually, in clinical trials, they're looking at improvements in urgency as actually one of the endpoints. So that's something that we want to look over time. So how do we want to do this? And these are conversations that you need to have with your provider anytime you start a treatment. The first is, how long will it take before I expect to see any form of improvement? And what sort of improvements should that be? And what is the objective assessment that you're going to do at what time points? Because there's different forms. Sometimes we check blood work. Sometimes we check stool studies, and sometimes we say, no, we need to do the scope and imaging. So you have to understand that time frame with your provider. And if you do have consist, consist, continued symptoms, what is the diagnostic evaluation going to be? Is it a scope every single time? Not always, because if there's something abnormal in your stool or in your blood work that we can follow instead for acute changes in symptoms, that's an important gauge. It's not just, I'm having more diarrhea, automatically you need to go on prednisone. It has to be followed with something, because many things can contribute to diarrhea, abdominal pain, and cramping, and we want to make sure that the punishment fits the crime. So I always like to use this time frame, and it's not necessarily because I want you to memorize this, but it's important to really just gauge how long it takes medications to work. Because we live in an Amazon Prime world, right? We want things to be better tomorrow or the same day. But as you know, your symptoms didn't just develop overnight. They, they were a culmination of months to weeks to years. Medications don't work overnight. So we need to have a gauge as to when we should expect some form of response some form of remission, which is the absence of symptoms that were active at the start of treatment, normalization of abnormal labs, as well as healing in terms of the colonoscopies. And it's important to get this gauge because if you're not achieving these endpoints by these time periods, then we have to ask ourselves, okay, do we need to adjust your treatment? Do we need to add something? Do we need to take a look? Or do we need to switch to something else? So how can you take ownership of these deltas or these changes over time? So last year, there was something that was approved that was called the 21st Century Cures Act. And what that means is that you actually, if your provider uses electronic medical records, you actually have access to your health information, structured or unstructured at no cost. And what this means is as results come back in real time, you're seeing them at the same time we're seeing them. And so it's important to be able to understand what labs are being drawn, why they're being drawn, and what you're looking for. But by the same token, you have to remember clinical context is key. You can't just uh, assume that every lab value is a crisis that holds up, that, uh, that lights up as yellow. 
because we actually don't stress over a single abnormal value. It's trends over time. Are things improving? Are things worsening? Even if for people who don't have IBD, for example, if we see an abnormal liver test, we don't automatically say, oh my gosh, you need to see the liver doctor. Now we say, okay, let's look and see what this could be due to and recheck it in four weeks. If it's still elevated, then we do more workup. Don't Google every single abnormal lab value. It's going to drive you nuts. I mean, I Google everything too, especially, you know, I have a dog and whenever she has diarrhea, I assume it's always Giardia. And it never is. It's because she ate something in the trash. But when you Google everything, it just adds more stress. The best answer is to have a line of communication with your care team, whether it's the care, uh, with the nurses, the nurse practitioners, the pharmacists, um, the physician providers. So ask them what you should be looking at. And don't get bogged down with all the data. When we order a blood count, the main labs that we're looking at are your white count, your hemoglobin, your hematocrit, and the platelets. But when you actually see it, you get about 20 different values. And not all of them are actually what we call clinically meaningful. It's just what the lab provides. So as an example, if you see these labs on the right, there are a number that are abnormal. Hemoglobin, hematocrit, albumin, inflammatory markers, and the stool study called the fecal cow protective. And you can say, wow, this patient's really sick. This is terrible looking labs. However, you have to compare it. So three months ago, everything was a lot worse. And so these are all trends towards improvement. So my comment would be like, this looks great. It's marked improvement. Let's continue what we're doing and recheck it in three months. So context is key. So now let's move on and talk about some of the newer agents that are being introduced into our IBD toolbox. And I don't want to get so bogged down on clinical trials or clinical study results, more just to let you know what's coming in the very near future or what's immediately available now, just so that you're familiar with some of these. So ustekinumab is a medicine that's currently available for Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. But in the very near future, there's actually probably going to be at least three more agents, rizinkizumab, guselkimab, and mirakizumab all names that are incredibly hard to pronounce, but the key thing is, is what's in yellow and green. So the way that ustekinumab works is it's what's called a P40 receptor antagonist. So it blocks the production of two different what we call cytokines, IL-12 and 23. The best way to explain that is these are plugs, IL-12 and IL-23 are plugs that bind to an outlet, which is P40. And when they bind, when the plug binds to the outlet, it turns on a series of reactions that can lead to increased inflammation. So if you block that pathway, you have decreased immune system signaling that decreases inflammation. Now the yellow one is P19, so that only blocks IL-23, not both IL-12 and 23. And all of these agents block that receptor so that it blocks the pathways designated for IL-23 only. Hopefully that makes some sense. So what's going to be available in the near future? Well, Rizinkizumab's FDA approval has already been submitted, their application, so we're expecting that it will likely be approved sometime this year. Mirakizumab, the application is expected to be submitted to the FDA later on this year, and that's for ulcerative colitis. So there's potentially, in the very near future, two more of these agents available in our therapeutic arsenal to potentially use in the very near future. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about these studies, but it's basically just to show you what some of the evidence is that's leading to these approvals. The blue bars are the treatment groups, the gray bars are the placebo groups, and simply put, Blue bars are higher than the green bar, uh, gray bars at a statistically significant value, and that was some of the impetus leading to potential approval for Crohn's disease. Similarly for ulcerative colitis, blue bars are greater than gray bars. That's why mirakizumab is going to be potentially approved by the FDA this year. But what I wanted to focus on this clinical trial for mirakizumab, if you go back, and remember when I was saying in terms of monitoring for ulcerative colitis, we care about stool frequency, uh, diarrhea, and we care about rectal bleeding. But urgency is also important as well. Well, mirakizumab is one of the first studies that built into their clinical trial design improvements in urgency. And they found that treatment with mirakizumab resulted in improvements in rectal urgency. So now that's really highlighting how clinical trialists are taking into account new and important clinical features that we have to assess when we're identifying which treatments to use. So what matters is how safe are these agents? And in truth, these agents are have the same or similar safety profile as ustekinumab. So these are actually fairly safe. They have actually lower rates of antibody formation compared to anti-TNF, such as infliximab, 
These can be used as monotherapy, therefore they don't have to be combined with another agent. Oftentimes we combine infliximab with a buddy to prevent or decrease the likelihood of antibody formation. But because these have lower rates of antibody formation, we can use them by themselves. And we do know that for many circumstances, a single agent is always better than multiple agents in the right clinical context to prevent infection. We also know that infection is the number one adverse effect for any kind of medication that works on the immune system, including corticosteroids. And so vaccinations are the number one preventive care measure to protect yourself from infection. But the blue box is the most important. The clinical evidence thus far shows low rates of serious adverse events that result in medication discontinuation or hospitalization low discontinuation rates, that means people who started it were more likely to stay on it, low serious infection rates, no malignancy signal to spar, no cancer signal, and no increased cardiovascular events, so therefore very safe. Tofacitinib is what's called a JAK inhibitor. And actually, earlier this year, um, so uh, I think it was actually just last month, upadacitinib, which is what's called a selective JAK inhibitor, was just FDA approved for the treatment of ulcerative colitis. So JAK inhibitors work sort of as a lock and key. So JAKs bind to something called a STAT, and that connection is needed to turn on downstream pathways that lead to increased inflammation. So if you block the JAK aspect of it, that lock can't bind to that key and turn on those downstream pathways. And the difference between upadacitinib is that it's more selective towards JAK1, whereas tofacitinib is what's called more non-selective. There are JAK1, 2, 3, and TIC2. And like I said, this was already FDA approved um, in March of 2022, and it was FDA approved primarily because of this data. Similar to the slides before, blue bars versus gray bars, and the blue bars are much higher than the gray bars that led to its approval. But what I want to focus on is a little bit of the adverse effects of JAK inhibitors because they did receive a little bit of press because of a study that was published in the New England Journal um, earlier this year, I believe. Now this is where, again, clinical context and patient selection is really key because they didn't include all comers with rheumatoid arthritis, which is what the study focused on. It included older patients, which was offensively defined as greater than 50, but they also had to have a cardiovascular risk factor. So it wasn't all comers, it was 50 and up with a cardiovascular risk factor. And that they found that there may be a cancer signal for solid tumors, and there may be an increased risk of cardiovascular events among people who already had a risk factor to begin with. And they also found that there may be an increased risk for blood clots, again, amongst people who are already at higher risk to begin with. So it's just this context that we use when we're thinking about which patients may JAK inhibitors be the best for. But at the end of the day, I want to or just emphasize that treatment decisions factor not only the risks of treatment, but the risks of uncontrolled disease. Because with uncontrolled inflammation on high doses of steroids, which are also associated with an increased cardiovascular risk, the greatest risk for infections, and actually the greatest risk for blood clots. And so uh, uncontrolled disease is associated with hospitalizations, infections, surgeries, and risks of colon cancer. There's risks of chronic steroid use in terms of what it does to your bones, infection, diabetes, like I said, cardiovascular disease, and blood clots. And the risk of undertreatment, not choosing the right agent because we're more risk averse than treating the disease averse. So that's where the conversations need to lie with your providers. Now, many of you know the agent vetolizumab, which is currently available as an infusion at weeks 0, 2, and 6 when you're starting, and then every eight weeks. But this is already actually approved in Europe. It's vetolizumab self-injections. And this was based on two studies called the Visible Study for Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, which actually showed no differences with the infusion versus the injection. So the way that the injection will be used is that you get your first two infusions at week zero and two, and instead of getting a third infusion at week six, you start getting self-injections. They're available either as a pen or a syringe, and then you give yourself an injection every two weeks. The nice thing is, is that what if you're already on vetolizumab every eight weeks? Then you could switch over to the injections every two weeks. Let's say you're on the injections every two weeks and you're like, you know what, this isn't for me because I'm not always around to sign for deliveries, refrigerate, I don't want needles around. Then you can switch back to infusions every eight weeks. If you're on a dosing that's more frequent than every eight weeks, vetolizumab injections are likely not for you because we don't have data on more frequent dosing than every two weeks. But this is coming in the near future.
Also important to note that will be available in July of 2023, so in about 16 months or 14 months. Um, actually, do the math. You can do the math. July of 2023. It's actually the first interchangeable biosimilar to adalimumab called Siltizo. So it's important to know this. If you're taking adalimumab or you may be in, on adalimumab in the future, it's approved for all the indications for inflammatory bowel disease, moderate to severe Crohn's and moderate to severe ulcerative colitis. And the important here is that there was a pivotal clinical trial that was called the um, Voltaire X study, where they actually had no, a numerous switches from branded adalimumab to the biosimilar adalimumab, back to the branded, back to the biosimilar. And because of that clinical trial, the FDA actually designated it as interchangeable, which means that it's potentially substituted at the pharmacy level. Currently, biosimilars can be actually interchangeable at the provider level, meaning a provider looks at the such generation and says, you know what, it's okay to be on the biosimilar and we're gonna get the authorization for it. But this one is at the pharmacy level. So is this allowed in your state? The honest truth is it is. In the vast majority of states in the US, including California and Arizona, where I'm located right now. So we need to understand a little bit of the nomenclature behind biosimilars. There's something called medical switching, which means we change an agent with the same base ingredient, like adalimumab, at a provider's discretion because we want to optimize a patient's benefit. So an example is, if any of you were on adalimumab before, maybe it burned a little bit when you gave the injection, and then they came out with a new formulation called citrate-free, and then it didn't burn as much. So that's called a medical switch because there was actually a change in an ingredient that resulted in a more adverse patient outcome. Non-medical switching means that the active ingredient and the majority of the inactive ingredients are pretty much the same. And in clinical trials, it's been de uh, demonstrated to be clinically equivalent. So they're essentially the same agent. And you switch it because they're, the person's actually stable and it's oftentimes dictated by changes in healthcare plans or um, healthcare systems. So in terms of a few more terms that you need to become familiar with is um, this transition, which is a non-medical switch, interchangeability, which is if, let's say you're on, and we're not supposed to use branded terms, but it's easier just to mention it, if you're on Remicade, and then you switch over to a biosimilar, when you're doing well, it's the same dose, same agent, same infusion monitoring, same uh, therapeutic drug monitoring, everything. That's called interchangeability because that's at the provider level, and automatic substitution is at the pharmacy level. So let's just get to the heart of the matter. Are biosimilars appropriate to use in IBD? Very important to know, these are not generics, so you cannot use those terms interchangeably because biosimilars are complex protein structures that require refrigeration because they're not uh, shelf-stable, whereas generics are chemical compounds, like when you get various forms of aspirin over the counter, those are generics. Protein-based structures, especially complex protein-based protein structures, are never completely identical. So if you go in for an infliximab infusion, from batch to batch, there's going to be subtle variations, and that's very essentially what a biosimilar is. The active ingredient is exactly the same, but clinically inactive compounds, minor little changes, may be slightly different. It's not a new mechanism of action, not compromising quality of care, same administration and handling, same monitoring strategies, same therapeutic drug monitoring, same monitoring for adverse reactions, and they actually have savings programs. So a lot of folks say, I don't want to switch from the branded to the biosimilar. But the honest truth is, there is an ample amount of data, both for Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, randomized controlled trial data. These have gone through a much more rigorous FDA approvals process, and healthcare systems are uh, switching over to biosimilars. And there, we should actually have a lot of confidence using them. I've been using them in my practice for a good number of years now, and there's really no difference. And what the problem is, is if you delay the treatment that you need for weeks and weeks, trying to fight for a brand name drug that's not absolutely necessary, and then you lose response, then you flare, then you develop antibodies, and then we're up a creek without a paddle. So what's much more important is to remember, you're not actually being treated by the brand name, you're being treated by the active ingredient, and if it's nearly identical, it's important to stay on schedule. So in the last few minutes, I wanna actually talk about the final objective, which is pre updated preventive care recommendations. Because over the past year, there's actually a few new ones. 
So this is a great resource from the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation's website with a healthcare maintenance checklist. And the first one I want to focus on is Zoster. So in July of last year, the FDA actually expanded the indication for the recombinant Zoster vaccine. So this is a non-live vaccine. Previously, it was only FDA approved for people over the age of 50. Now it's FDA approved for patients over the age of 18 who are on immunosuppression. So if you're on any form of immunosuppression, talk to your primary care team, your GI team about getting the shingles vaccine series, which are two doses, two to six months apart. Very important. The other one is pneumococcal vaccines. So these were just updated within the past couple of months. Previously, if you're on immunosuppression and under the age of 65, this was the recommendation. PCV 13, then PPSV 23 eight weeks later, then a booster of PPSV 23 five years later, then a second booster of PPSV 23 after the age of 65. That is complex. So. The FDA just approved something called the PCV20 vaccine or the PCV15 vaccine. The PCV20 vaccine is a one-time vaccine that protects from pneumococcal vaccine, uh, pneumo the primary strains of pneumococcus that can lead to pneumonia. The PCV15 is another vaccine, which is one vaccine followed by a PPSV23 one year later. So much more simple. If you haven't gotten your pneumonia vaccine series, very important to do so. Vaccine preventable condition and PCV20 is probably the simplest way to go. Last healthcare maintenance is colorectal cancer. So we do know that there's a number of risk factors for GI cancers among the IBD patients. And the most important one that we need to be aware of is colon cancer. Both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, if you have colonic Crohn's disease that involves greater than a third of your colon. If you only have small bowel Crohn's disease and your colon is normal, you do not need to follow these rigorous colonoscopy schedules. But if you have had colonic involvement, it's very important that you do. So it's very important for you to know where your colon is located and if you do follow into a surveillance protocol. But it's also important to know that if you have small bowel Crohn's disease, you shouldn't be getting colonoscopies with biopsies all throughout your colon every year or two. So really make sure that the indication is appropriate. The reason why I brought this up was there was actually a publication last year that actually updated col uh, colonoscopy surveillance recommendations based on not only disease activity and the traditional risk factors, but also how well you're doing. So if there's quite a bit of activity, then your colonoscopy uh, will be recommended to occur again in one year. But let's say you're doing great. You don't have a history of colon polyps or dysplasia. You don't have any family history of colorectal cancer. And your colon is nicely healed. You can actually go up to five years in between colonoscopies. So if you have a very well healed colon, you don't need to have an annual colonoscopy. So if that is an incentive to try to get your colon healed, I'm not sure what is. So take home messages. When starting any treatment, ask the following of your healthcare team. How long should it take for me to see some improvement? What potential adverse effects could I expect along the way? How are we monitoring for response and safety? And when do we move on to a new agent? Potentially some of these ones that are either FDA approved now or will be in the near future. And emphasize that under treatment of disease activity, delays in treatment and chronic steroid use are actually associated with more adverse effects than the appropriate medications started at the right time. So that's really key. The right agent at the right time will always be more effective and more safe than under treatment or delays. And staying updated with preventive care is important. Don't forget about it. Talk to your doctors about the updated Zoster vaccine series recommendations, the new pneumococcal vaccines, and potentially about maybe the possibility of stretching out your colonoscopy intervals if you're doing well. And I'm happy to answer questions during the panel later on this afternoon. Thank you for the invitation.